Put on some weight. I have put on some weight. I like to eat. I don't smoke crack anymore. <laughs> definitely a you know easy to get skinny on that stuff yeah you don't eat when you're taking it right no uh you'd start to when you're really hungry but that takes a couple days two three days but i i've spent some time with people who are on that drug and some of the other drugs and they just don't eat yeah i think meth is even more meth is worse yeah but eventually you like realize you're hungry like it just comes to you like on the third day of not eating and then you take a bite of anything and it's the most delicious thing you've ever tasted. <laughs> really? Like a 7-Eleven hot dog. Yeah. I still like 7-Eleven hot dogs from, you know, from then. So your, your story is so interesting. You, you and just a, maybe a handful of people that I've interviewed have, have climbed out of that terrible lifestyle you guys were in. How, how did you do it? Um, I mean, I don't know. I, honestly, I think that talking to you was maybe the start of a, of a shift. It's just that being, see, more than anybody I think I interviewed, you were the most forthcoming and totally raw, honest. Yeah. Here's the ugly truth of everything I'm doing. Yeah. And I think that somehow takes the weight off your shoulders. It was it was a combination of that. It was funny because I, I can remember, sometimes it's hard for me to remember uh, even, it's hard for me to like relate to doing all that stuff, <laughs> right? To living that way. Sure. But I can remember it and I remember I can remember coming and doing the interview, the first one specifically. And I remember, you know, having that, ah, you know what, I'm just going to tell the truth. You know, maybe it was a cry for help or whatever. Then I remember it getting published and being petrified, like being like, oh, my God, what did I do? Because when it got published, I think I was, you know, out of temporarily out of money. I mean, I was about to be on like a six week crazy bender. Mm -hmm. And I think I did the interview with you in the, the first stage of it. So I'm, you know, depressed, sleeping, and then the interview gets published. I remember my brother. I was I was at my grandmother's house, and my brother and I, I could hear he's li he's listening to it like, whoa, and I can hear the whole thing, and I'm just like, oh man, what have I done? But then the comments, you know, the feedback, which was so overwhelmingly positive, I think that was the start of um, the idea that brutal honesty is has like some sort of healing power to it. You know, that, that's that's one of the things that helps me believe in what I'm doing is because I, I yeah. know that that is a huge part of yeah. getting through you through get out, getting out of these. Situations. Right. That was the be that was the beginning. That whole time was the beginning of me sort of it's, I mean, I don't think it ever completely goes away, but it was extreme prior to um, especially like in my periods, my brief periods of temporary sobriety in between binges, all those especially like the last you know, seven to 10 years um, of during the sober periods. And it was never more than a year, never a year. It was like six months average, nine months, sometimes three months of um, desperately trying to keep like the, my identity as an addict and all that completely separate from what I was trying to portray myself as like at work or in society maybe, but mostly at work because that's where I spent the majority but, but, but of my time. But my channel is so big now. It's like you, you, must, right. have, you so, must have become like... I, yeah, I know, right. And so... How'd you keep your job? Um, you must have the coolest the, boss prob ever. Probably, well, he, he was helpful, but he... I mean, one thing about my boss is that he always was very careful with it, when it came to dealing with me and my absence from work to following the rules, like... Never, never even coming close to breaking any of the rules that exist. I, I still have my job at the city, and there's rules, right, as far as what you do when a guy, you know, doesn't show up. And probably the one thing that I had going for me that helped me maintain the job was always being honest. So, like, I was never caught, like, driving under the influence at work or even ever showing up there. Um, it might just be good luck that my particular addiction takes the form of, like, I'm not even thinking about showing up to work. You know, I'm doing this. <laughs> um, but then eventually I will go to rehab or I will say, you know, I have a medical thing. I will go to a doctor and send in a note. You know, I go to a doctor and tell the truth. And the doctor will write a note saying that I'm unable to work, which is true. And then I think I definitely benefited. I mean, if, if this was like 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't have the job no matter how honest I was. But, you know, addiction is sort of accepted as a medical condition. And, uh, you know, I went to like 23 rehabs, you know, so I always did that. Um, 
and especially so, you know, at the end. So all those factors, you know, I think play in. Um, but there was like a period of time where, you know, like people started knowing about the videos. I think it took about a year. You know, I, met, I had a guy come up to me in the parking lot at work, you know, and this was before I finally got completely sober. I think I had one more relapse in between us meeting and then that, and then a bunch of time went by um, and then I came back to work and then had one more relapse. Um, but um, one guy came up to me in the parking lot to say, hey man, I, you know, I saw your video. I don't know how to say this to you. You know, he was kind of like, you know, timid about it. And, but he was very encouraging. He's like, keep up the good work, man. If there's anything I can do to help. I think that brutal honesty really just makes people connect with you. Yeah, and, and it helped me get to a place of, a, of much greater acceptance of who I am and what I'm dealing with, you know? Um, trying to hide it from everybody, you know, and trying to like sort of perform my way into like some delusion or illusion that I had in my head of, uh, if I can just be super awesome and have everyone think I'm brilliantly smart all the time, then that will, like internally maybe, if they think I'm awesome, then maybe that'll do something to the fact that I hate who I am, or I hate what I do, you know, all the time, sort of consistently. Maybe it was something like that. That transformed into like, this is who I am, you know, like the whole thing. Like if you want to know what it's like to be addicted to hard drugs and do crazy things, I can tell you <laughs> because I am <laughs> a person just, like that. You just made a, a 1 million view video about it. Yeah. And, and so, so that definitely helped, you know, that definitely helped. And I think it still continues to help. Um, in the sense of like, you know, even though it's hard for me to connect back to that, you know, because I have to, I'm not to completely honest to say that it's been two years. Tomorrow, we kind of set it up to come to tonight because tomorrow is two years uh, uh, sober, consistently sober. That's great. And uh, it's amazing. And I have not wanted to get high. There have been zero uh, instances of, man, I really want to get high, but I'm just going to like resist or even like do the things you're supposed to do, like call someone and, and talk about it. It just hasn't come. That's beautiful to hear. Yeah. I mean, that's the way, I mean, you, I, you used I, to call me in the middle of the night saying, Mark, can I get a few hundred bucks just to like, well, yeah, I'm because good it was, one it was, yeah, there was no, there was no choice if, for me at that time. And, and a lot of people will say, oh, and you gave it to him, but people don't understand that in that situation at two, yeah. three in the morning, you're going to get it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to try to get it. You're gonna get it, but yeah. the way you're gonna get it is gonna put Who you knows? in Who knows? Yeah, who knows in what danger will happen, of something. You know? So yeah, that's true. I mean, there is a sense of that. A prison, a disease, a gun, or whatever. It's, it's a fine line, you know? It's, I, I mean, I wasn't, I never really drifted too far, like never guns and almost never crime, unless like, unless it was like very personal, like someone left some money laying around, <laughs> the kind of thing. But I would be out like on the hunt for, you know, some opportunity versus if I'm using back then versus if I have what I want, then I'm going to be like holed up in a hotel room or something. So you could, there's ways of saying that it would be safer. I mean, there's been, you know, like there's like the harm reduction theory, um, all that. And, and, and be, and becoming more honest, I was even more honest, like in, during my using times at towards the end after sort of meeting you and, you know, even going to the point where telling some of my close loved ones in advance, whereas always before, I would just disappear. You know, I would know, like, hey, I have an opportunity to go get high again, like tomorrow, or you know, if there'll be money coming in, or, or whatever, two day, two days from now, and or I'd be at my mom's in Arizona, where I would go, sort of, I went out there a few times for a few weeks at a time when I had nowhere else to go, and then the opportunity would come to get high, but I'd have to come back to LA to do that. And I started just saying it in advance, like, hey, uh, I'm gonna get, go get high, <laughs> you know, telling you now, throwing it out there, so at least you know. You, you have some of the best people I've ever seen in your life. Yeah, Your Your mom yeah. was incredibly understanding. Yeah. I would, I would have talks, a few talks with her along the way, and then your new wife, I went to your wedding. Uh, yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah, that was great. Just recently. <laughs> that was fun, right? It was really fun. It was a great <laughs> wedding. It's probably the best wedding I've ever been to. Is that right? And a big one. It was a big wedding. It was too. a big wedding. I, you know what? I'm so proud of Nancy. <laughs> um, 
I'm proud of Nancy. I'm getting goosebumps right now. No, I tell you what, me too. Yeah. Of all the stories. Yeah. That are, you know, she should be sitting next to you right now. Yeah, I just I talked to her on the way out here. I'm because, like, give me a pep talk. <laughs> I don't know her that yeah. well. I, yeah. I don't know. Her. I just met her at the wedding, but yeah. I feel like I I know her so well because I know what she went through. I know how she yeah. was there through your darkest. She period. was there the whole time, and I probably didn't talk about her much, you know, at the no, beginning. At the beginning, but she was there. You know, she was there. She's always been there all these years. And I went through periods of time. I went through several periods of time of like thinking that we weren't meant for each other, you know, and, and thinking of her more like as a really close friend, like a best friend. Um, but I'm also, back then, I'm getting high and I'm out like a sex addict, trying to have sex with every woman I see. I mean, that's what it was. And she, and she rode those periods She out. knew I was doing that, but I, um, she understood that that was part of the addiction. Um, but also that would have, that may have stopped me from even really thinking about her probably in the beginning of those high interviews I gave you. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of I came to my senses uh, after getting sober, um, probably around six months sober. I remember you you called me and wanted me to run a 5K with you or something like that in Pasadena. Yeah, yeah we did that. And I went up to the park and we, we, we met there. And after the run, I think you and I talked and you mentioned how you're, you're, you're like really serious about about Did her. I? Okay, so I'm not. It's it's hard, it's hard for me to remember exactly when that run happened, um, but yeah. But you, that, that was the point where I realized, wow, you really might be. Was I? Funny I never relapsed again after that. No. Okay, so that was so it was then. Yeah, it was, it was like a year ago, year and a half ago. Okay, that makes sense then, because it was like in the in the fall, right? I think I remember it was, it was like cold. A, it was a cold morning, right? Yeah, and it was like you know, we belong together. We're like soulmates we're like best friends i mean we you would not believe how well we get along we've never really argued you know when a partner does something what r rides out of, of of whatever you guys were going through whatever yeah. you were going through yeah rides that out yeah. and forgives you yeah that's, that's she's, gotta, she knows about it all that's got to make a connection like it's unmatched i mean sometimes i say like how did you do that you know and she'll be like i don't know you know i mean just it's, so it's just so extensive. I think she, know? I mean, what it requires is for her to understand. I'm sure she would say this better than both of us put together. Mm. I'm sure she understood that that wasn't Patrick. I think that's true. That was Patrick on this crazy drug. And I've seen people do some of the craziest shit ever on these drugs. Yeah. It's not them. Right. You know, Re Rebecca, who I interviewed, like the, the yeah. asshole that you see Rebecca being sometimes, yeah. is not who she really is. Right. I've seen who she really is and it's beautiful. Yeah. But on the drug, she's a monster. Yeah, so that that's probably true. That's definitely true in Nancy's case, and that's also true, like in my parents' case. You know, like in my mom and and my dad. I have great relationships. They are great people. I have awesome people all around. Um, so yeah, I, and great friends at the wedding. I saw your. Friends. It was awesome, right? It was so <laughs> it was so cool. Like I, like I think I came in at, right after proposing to her on Christmas Day last year. Yeah. So like what, fifteen months ago. And then it was like, it was like she's been waiting her whole life to plan her wedding. I mean, she's, I mean, Nancy's very bright, uh, talented girl. She's, she's like a project manager. Um, so, I mean, she, I mean, I did very little. Like, I tried to participate as much as she wanted me to, but I mean, she found the spot and we just did kind of did the whole process together, like making the guest list, you know, was a little bit of a tug of war because we have so many people. Yeah, and exactly. she was like telling me like, ah, you have so many people. What do you, why so many people need to come? And then someone would like ask me about it. Like, like literally I had a couple of people directly ask me if they were invited and they were not. <laughs> <laughs> and then so I called Nancy after that, like, hey, can we add? <laughs> okay. And none of the people from the, those dark days. Are no, no, none of the from people from the dark days that I would, get high with were never really like people that I actually knew. I mean, I became friends with a handful, maybe like maybe two or three of them. But honestly, they're really more acquaintances than friends. Well, I met them by going down into South Central. And buying drugs. And getting, and and getting, high, drugs getting and high with them, yeah. So I would, call, I would consider them like an acquaintance after I went back again six months later and connected back with them and then maybe did that a third time. So... You know, there are a couple of people that I still think about sometimes um, because they're also good people. They're also you know, good when people. you're when you're down there and in that sort of environment, and sometimes it would be like, you know, two, three days, maybe a week, you know, at a time. 
you're not just only getting high 100% of the time. Like you're hanging out with them. And so you can see the good side of people, you know, especially when you're hanging out with them like a little bit longer. But no, no, I, there, there's nobody that I really would ever, because like the crack is not like, it's not like I, I know anyone that ever smoked crack other than down that, you know, wherever I would go and meet up with, we'd meet up with like people I'd never knew before. Or the only other place that I'll know people that smoked crack before, of course, would be like in, in rehab or in recovery meetings or places like that. So plenty of the people at the wedding used to do that. You just wouldn't know now because they've been clean, you know, multiple years. Yeah, I think I think I was sitting at a table. We said, "Man, if you knew my history, you yeah. Patrick was was tame." Yeah, you sat with my buddy Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's and he's <laughs> he, yeah, he's a great guy. I'm gonna see him tonight. Um, so yeah, but there's plenty. There's probably I think three tables of uh, recover oh, you know, right? recover alcoholics and addicts. You yeah. never know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like my buddy Steve, who's like a he's like a father figure to me. He was there. He's, he's been like 34 years, I think. And all the way down the line. So in one of our talks, we talked about trying to figure out what the solution is to this. Yeah. Whether it's God, whether it's, yeah, you know, we were just like brainstorming and bouncing ideas back and forth. Yeah. What, what did you find helped you? Well, because we, well, definitely God, but I mean, just to say that doesn't really, I don't feel like it really answers the question, right? Like, okay, right. God's the solution. Great. Now what? You know, like, <laughs> and I do think that that God has been like the the main character in this for me, but I feel like I believed that for years before before you could see any sort of permanent change in me. I mean, the only whenever this question gets asked, like the only thing I can say is like is to describe my experience, which was like a repeated going back to it, you know, it getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, like I, I, I definitely came to believe in the sort of hopeless nature of addiction more than ever towards the end, you know? Um, I think that, that might have been played a, a factor into why I was so willing to be completely honest about it was because I, I really did believe that the, in a, to a large degree or, or, or to a total degree, that as a real addict, I'm, I don't have a choice, you know? Like, I don't have a choice. Like, if I had a choice, why would I do it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, life, life can be so good. I mean, I love the feeling, for sure, but why would I do it knowing? Like, I would do it at the, at the last couple of years knowing exactly what's gonna happen. Like, okay, you're gonna do this, and then you're gonna blow off everything, you're gonna spend every dollar you can get your hands on. You're going to go from whatever money you have available to like negative 20K because of all the stupid money you could get and they want you to pay them back. And you're going to put your job at great risk. Uh, and then you're going to, you're going to want to be dead. I, I knew that. So, so you overdose on fentanyl. What, what was that like? Do you remember? That was a crazy story. I do remember. Um, so I was on the East coast. I was in, um, I think Taunton, Massachusetts. I had left the Teen Challenge program a week prior, and I had been smoking crack for a couple of days. This was like two years ago. Yeah, this would have been what is it, 24? This would have been the summer of 21. Yeah, summer of 21. So we did our, all of our first few interviews like January to March. I go to this program that was six months, and I couldn't stand it and left after three. And um, with no desire to get to get loaded, by the way. And then within a week, I'm smoking crack in Taunton, right? Where <laughs> I don't know anything, don't know anything, don't really have much money. <clears throat> so I remember I was like, I was excited still on like a Friday after doing this for a couple of days because I was excited and I, this is how it would be. Like I had $200 left to my name. And the fact that it was that amount and not zero was like exciting because I was gonna hunt down some crack somehow. Um, but it was before that I'm walking and, um, I meet a girl or a girl says my name randomly on the street, like kind of like in front of like the Taunton city hall. And she knew me from the channel. So she recognized me walking down the street from seeing my videos on your channel. And, um, I right away was like, she's hot, you know, like young, hot girl. And, and, uh, she's asked me what I'm doing, tells me I should come over to her, 
her apartment and I, uh, I said, well, you know, do you smoke? I'm smoking. And she, yeah, yeah, I got it. So I'm so excited, you know, and I, said, I get the address and I get the money. Some, however, I had to walk. I had to walk. I, wound up, I remember I wound up getting a ride from a random lady at a liquor store that drove me 15 minutes to this girl's house. So, um, you know, I smoked crack with her and her friends for a couple hours and then didn't want to leave, you know, but she had other things to do. And I stayed around the area, you know, like I had some, some, some drugs left. And so I, um, a friend of hers, this older guy, really, he was a real cool guy. We hung out with his place basically for the weekend and sort of like scammed my dad into sending money. You know, like I had money, disability money or something that was going to my dad. He was holding it for me. So if I had access to that, I could have done some real damage, you know. And I think we made up some story like that. I was staying at her place. And I remember having him talk to her, you know, like the, the shitty things we put people through. I'm like just totally lying to my dad. He knows it, I'm sure. He's not stupid. But he's, he sends her, I think, a thousand bucks or something. Um, and then another day goes by. <clears throat> so, so anyway, the story of the fentanyl um, happens the second night. And, you know, all I had in my mind was like, I want to be with this girl. You know, this girl's like, you know, gorgeous and we're smoking crack together. So I had this whole sort of fixation that you would, I would get stuff like that back then when I was using. And we're getting high together like the next night and it's just the two of us. And I'm still feeling like, you know, we're not like, it's, nothing's happening like that with her and me and, and um, you know, I really, uh, if you really think about it, I'm stuck on the East Coast with a girl that's probably not interested in anything like other than like there's money, you know, to do. Um, and she, but she would do fentanyl a little bit. I remember like knowing that, like a little bit, like at the end of the night kind of thing. Um, so at one point I asked her, let me try some of that, you know, and I, I think I just wanted to connect with her or I just didn't care, you know, like it, it, the thought, if I remember right, kind of crossed my mind, like, this is dangerous, but I didn't, but it was like, well, who cares? Like what, so you, if, what, you know, what great thing are you losing if you, if some bad thing happens with fentanyl, you're smoking crack with strangers on the other side of the country, like you're not going anywhere. Um, and so I said, give me like the smallest amount, you know, I can remember her still, she, she's like, just, because it's a tiny amount, right? And I snorted it. And she even did it. Like, she's like, here, just do this. And if you don't feel anything, then, then here's another little one. So I did it. And uh, another girl had come over that was, that I didn't know. Cause she had come over like a few minutes earlier. They were sitting there. And that other girl did fentanyl more than crack. And I remember feeling, like not liking the feeling you know, like way too intense. I had done heroin before years ago, you know, a handful of times. So I know, I, I knew that feeling and there is a pleasantness. I mean, I, there's no drug feeling that I didn't enjoy, you know, but, and I remember the heroin feeling, but this was like that, but way overboard to where I couldn't keep my eyes open. I was feeling like very sweaty, you know, and just like, oh, I don't like this feeling like nauseous a little bit. And it was, it was probably minutes before I was out. And from what I'm told, like turning blue on the floor of this girl's apartment. Thank God she uh, called 911, you know, because apparently what I was told was the other girl was telling her, don't, you know, don't call. Because there's drugs around? Yeah. And she, this girl had tons of crack in there and fentanyl. And then what I remember was, all I remember was waking up, you know. And I woke up, it was like I was in the middle of a violent rage already. You had handcuffs on? Prior to waking up. So I wake up handcuffed behind my back. The room's full of cops. And you can, I could only really tell they were cops, but there was also, so it was like cops and then paramedic people in this room, in this living room of this girl's apartment. I'm handcuffed behind my back and I'm like violently thrashing about, like on purpose. I remember... And it was already happening. I didn't wake up and start doing that. I woke up to find myself already doing that, which probably was why I was handcuffed, right? I don't think they would have started the OD treatment with handcuffs, right? Mm -hmm. I'm handcuffed and, I, and, they're, and they're like sharp against my wrists because I'm thrashing about. And I guess I was like spitting at the police and saying, fuck you, you know, like angry at them. Um, and I could feel myself like, 
sort of like gathering and then throwing all my weight like to the sides, you know, like then gathering again, it was like uncontrollable. And then throwing all my weight to the sides to try to be as like difficult to contain as possible. And I remember, so this apartment was a, an upstairs apartment. So to, like there was a back door and then outside the door you go downstairs. And then there's also a front door. And that's how houses are in the East, right? You open the front door and then it's just a staircase, right? So they're taking me out. I remember they're taking me out the, the front door. So it's like a staircase where there's like three stairs and then a corner and then 10 stairs down to the front. And I can remember like finally getting up and then that was just, it was all painful, you know, cause I'm thrashing against the handcuffs. And I remember like each step, it was like, here we go, ah, down the steps. And they get me down and um, they get me at the bottom once we're like on, on the porch or maybe right at the bottom of the porch outside now, they get me onto a, like a stretcher to go to an ambulance. And I can still remember the stretcher came down, the, down to the sidewalk and then turned and now we're going down the sidewalk just a little bit to the ambulance and it was there. So now I'm on the sidewalk, the house is to my left is when it occurred to me. And I said it out loud like, oh shit, I just OD'd. So I, all the way from upstairs, I, I, was, I had puked, there was puke, at some point in this, I remember. Now, when I get down there, I realize what happened. You know, I, I remember doing the fentanyl, and then black, and then I remember. Then I stop remembering anything, and then I remember. And the, 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 there was a. By the time I was on the stretcher, like the people closest to me were the paramedic people, who were a little bit more compassionate <laughs> than the cop. The cops were like, "Fuck this guy," you know. <laughs> I was telling him, <laughs> I was spitting on him, and and uh, she's like, "Yeah." I was like, "Holy shit." I OD'd, oh my gosh, you know? And then right from there, I was back to myself. I was no longer violent. I was no longer like in control, uncontrollably doing anything. I think I remember talking to that paramedic lady a lot in the short ride to the hospital, you know, about whatever, probably telling her I'm an addict and whatever, you know? And then I remember they forced me to stay at the hospital for a certain amount of time because Oh yeah, it was six Narcans. Did I say that already? It was yeah. six, six Narcans that they gave me to, to wake me up. Wow. The girl at the apartment had one. She gave it to me. Probably, I'm not, I can't remember the details, but I'm guessing she gave me one and I didn't wake up and then they called 911. Hmm. Five more. And apparently like there's a rule about, you gotta wait until so much time after the Narcan to make sure that I don't have a bad reaction to the Narcan. So I stayed at the hospital that amount of time just w couldn't wait to leave thinking that as soon as I leave here, I can go keep smoking crack uh, either back there or wherever. That's all I wanted to do. And by the end of the however three hours or something it was, I was, could barely stay awake, you know, cause now I'm not using and I'm, you know, two days, it's been two days. Anyway, that's my one time using fentanyl. Uh, thank you. Thank you for calling the, uh, the police and saving my life. You know who you are. God bless you. <laughs> Maybe you're still a channel watcher. Um, and that's one of the countless times, you know, where I easily could have been dead. And, you know, God had other plans, you know, through whatever set of circumstances, uh, you know, I, I survived and it wasn't my fault. Like I can't take credit. Like, Hey, I survived a fentanyl overdose. No, I was taken through that. And I'm grateful for it. Anyhow, so what happened was it got so bad and, and so, like I got to the point where I was, I couldn't care less anymore about my life. I was so fed up with it. I didn't really care about being sober. I just wanted to get, be as high as possible. At the end I was doing like sherm, like angel dust and a lot of meth, putting myself in super dangerous situations with people. Um, and when it, when it finally ended, um, it was like I had nothing left to hold on to, you know? I was like, this is me, um, my life is gone. You know, really like, I think that might be part of it. Like, like, it was, like they call it surrender. I always hated people telling me you just have to surrender because that's like saying, you know, just trust in God. It's like, okay, how? Like, what does that mean? Um, so I feel like it happened to me, you know, like I, I can remember being in that 
at rehab house where I started being sober now. And um, there was no more like, there's no more like good ideas. There's no more strategies, you know? I didn't know if I was gonna have my job. I didn't care. That's, that. I, so I didn't, and none of it is like something that I thought of doing and then did. It was like realizing how my attitude was as it already existed or looking back on it, you know? That had never been the case. Like, I don't really care if I get my job back. But that's that was where I found myself. Because um, a lot of times it, my identity was wrapped up in that, you know? Be, you know, because it would be like, I don't care because if I don't stay clean, then it won't matter. And if I do stay clean, then it won't matter, <laughs> you know? But what is, what is behind that re reckless, self-destructive behavior? Is it... In the first place? In the first place. Is it, is it just... Your self worth is is beaten down, or um, I don't know. You know, like looking all the way back, like to what started it. Like I always loved any substance, starting with alcohol and marijuana, and then getting into all the hard drugs. Is it and, in your family? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, mental health and and addiction definitely are in my family. I have a very close family member right now that um, you know is struggling. You know, I'll, I'll say that much. Um, uncles, cousins, definitely alcohol. Um, so it definitely runs in the family. My parents don't have it, you know, but others in the family have over the years. Um, so we, so there's a propensity there, I guess. So just the classic sort of, you know, I love when I, when I was, took my first drink, I couldn't believe that being drunk was an option. Like, I was great, you know. Um, I, my, my brain thinks a lot. Like, I... That's kind of like nonstop thinking, and there's a, there's a, a sense of uh, relief from that when you're under the influence of anything, you know. Like, cracks just like super extreme <laughs> version of that, you know. It's like unplugging. My buddy, we talk about you take one, and then especially if it hasn't been a while, then it's just like your brain unplugs, and you don't have to care anymore. So when you care too much, especially about what other people think of you. You know, alcohol and drugs can be, you know, they, can, they I mean, it, it, if you can do it without getting addicted or you can do it without ruining your life, there's there's <clears throat> plenty of situations where they're helpful. And, and so your life is better now? Definitely. Yeah. Life's, you, life's you, awesome. You enjoy being married? <laughs> I love being married. Um, I was talking, I was, we were talking about this really briefly before. We get along. Like, I mean, Nancy's great. Nancy's great. Like it was funny because like, we were t her and I were talking about this. We went through that year, like planning the wedding, you know. And I was like, I hope this this goes well, you know. Uh, and it went really well. But it, like that was kind of the focus. I, we, I was barely. We, I don't think either of us were really thinking much about. Well, then after that, we're going to be married, <laughs> you know. Like we did get an apartment where we now live. Um, that I moved into about six months before the wedding. So I lived there alone. She, she didn't move in with me until after the wedding. Um, we got married, we went to Cancun for like five days and laid around down there and uh, came back and we've been, It's I don't know, like she's great. She's great, I make her laugh. I, she's constantly just laughing, guys, I'm, I'm goofy like with her. Really like connected. We're yeah, we're like we're best friends, yeah, you mean, know. How how much of all of that was because she r stuck it out with you through the, through your darkest period. You know, I I don't you know I don't think about that much, but that's a good question. Um the fact that she was there for all of that you know, and we're talking going back years, going back that, five, to six. To me, that six, would be one of the most years. powerful things. Yeah, our connection is just. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, and so I live in that with her every day. So, like, because you know, she loves you. Oh yeah, like I know it's that. Not like she just thinks you're tall and handsome. No, she loves me like you wouldn't believe. But I also love her like that. You know, like, like I love her more and more every day. You know, we lay there. I, sometimes she's sleeping, and I get there, I just look at her, and it's. Uh, it's it's like nothing I've ever experienced. It's not like, uh, you know, like I can think of being younger and being like, oh man, I want her, you know, like a like a physical thing. Like it's, we just have this deep connection. Um, you know, she's my Nancy. I tell her that all the time, you know. Um, it's really cool being married to her. She's a great cook. Uh, 
we're both kind of simple, I think I would say. You know, like I come home from work and she makes dinner and we sit on the couch, <laughs> watch it, watch it, TV. It, it, she she becomes someone you want to grow old with. We're gonna grow old together. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. She's uh, she's cool. She's cool. She's got a great family. Uh, you know, I love her family. Her family accepts me, and uh, they don't they don't I don't know. They know a little bit, but not not too much. Um, so I don't know what to say. I, I didn't. I never realized that like being married would be so uh, would feel so good. You know, would be so um, like what's the word? I never knew like that I would want to be married. Like I would not trade that. You know, for anything. And I never thought of that. I mean, for I probably spent plenty of time prior. You know, over the years worried that I wouldn't want to do that. You know, worried that I'd be, you know, boxing myself into a situation that was supposed to be permanent that I wouldn't want to be a part of. And that's completely the opposite of how it's going and, and the, you know, how it is. So, so yeah, we're, uh, we're happy. She's definitely happy. I'm happy. Uh, she lets me do the things I like to do, you know, like on the side, which is uh, golf and poker. Um, <clears throat> and then you know, I try my best to be a good husband and to be attentive and, <laughs> you know, uh, and I think I do a pretty good job. We we're going to, we're going to travel. She loves to travel. I, she loves to travel. I enjoy traveling. But I haven't really, you know, being a drug addict for the last 20 years sort of like reduces the travel you options. never travel. Not, yeah, not plan a vacation. I, I would plan stuff and then in between the planning and the execution, <laughs> something would <laughs> go wrong. Yeah, so... We're going to, we might go to Korea and Japan. She's going for sure. I might go. We're going to the East Coast this year. Yeah. It's just nice to see somebody who seemed like, like of all the people I interviewed, I would have picked you as somebody that could have pulled themselves out of this. Yeah. It's nice to see that happen. I, it's amazing. And, and I, you know, I like to be repetitive, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, Ever since I, the desire to be sober came back, and it, it wasn't, you know, I kind of like drifted from like the first couple of weeks, all I wanted to do was get loaded again any way I could and um, because I had given up on life. But there was something, like there was some kernel of giving up that was like, um, had the power to, to, to access sobriety in it. Um, and then, it, the desire to get loaded hasn't come back, has not come back. That's probably a miracle, you know, because I couldn't make that happen. Um, but accepting who I was, you know, like I'm going to do it again. I'm going to die like this. Like that's what the, all the evidence points to. And I think maybe if I could say one other thing that's kind of occurring to me right now as we talk about it, the one thing that was true leading up to me meeting you, right? So you, so I came to you and you looked at me as someone that if you had to pick people that you had known, you'd be, I'd be one that you picked that could maybe do it. Yep. Prior to coming to you, I had been trying. Like I had le been legitimately trying for 15, 20 years. You know, I had already probably been to 20 or 21 rehabs at that point. Um, I had sort of accepted that I had a serious problem that I need and that I needed to be, I wasn't in, in any sort of like delusion or, you know, denial that I have a problem or I want to try to manage this. I don't know. That's just like the one thing I'll say that maybe helped, you know, they, they sometimes they say like in the, in the recovery programs, um, that, you know, it takes what it takes, you know, keep coming back, keep trying. And I, that I would definitely, um, endorse that message to people that, you know, are struggling with this, you know, to, to try, to keep trying, you know, there's something about that. Cause if, uh, if I wouldn't have been trying to get sober at some level, at least when it was time for the thing to happen, that kind of, the kind of switch to flip inside of me, it probably wouldn't have, you know what I mean? Like if I was just like, I'm just going to keep doing this. I don't care. So, 
Let me ask you one question that yeah. I ask a lot of people who are in the middle of their addiction. Yeah. But now you've climbed yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you think the most misunderstood thing is about people that have this problem? You asked me that in my first interview. It's like the one, one of the only things I remember about that interview. And it's the lack of choice that an addict has about using. You know, I, I firmly believe that. That there's a <clears throat> that there's a subset of the population, and I'm part of that, you know, 10%, they say, 15% that have the disease of addiction or disease of alcoholism or whatever. And one of the definitions of that disease, there's a couple. One is like once you start, you have no control over when you're going to stop. But the second, more like nefarious part of it is there's something wrong with our brains that once we stop, once we're physically sober, something in our brains is going to convince us to do it again something wrong in our brains. There's something in our brains that's gonna take us back. There's gonna be like the obsession for that drug or that drink or whatever it is. And that if it's in my brain, if, I, if my brain is broken to the point where I'm, I am gonna go do that again, then I don't have the choice. Like that's, you know, cause the choice would be also in my brain, right? So that part's broken. Right. And you choose not to do it. <clears throat> yeah. If I if I had the ability to choose not to do it, I wouldn't do it. But if I accept that that's my brain and I'm dealing with that issue, that takes away a lot of the strategizing my way out of it. Because anything where, that I'm using my brain to do to get out of it is like by definition going to fail because that my brain is where the problem is. And so like instead of like what do I need to do? You know, I just need to do. It, it was like. I'm screwed. It was like almost like that. It was kind of weird. Right? It's kind of like counterintuitive. Like you know, I'm fucked. You know, like I, I, I'm so an what, So what was the attitude that actually I, helped you? I, that <laughs> I'm fucked. Just, like, just yeah. give, give up. Yeah, and then and then there were people around that were like doing things like, okay, go to the rehab session. All right, you know, if I if I if I'm in really in that place of like I, I'm screwed. You just surrender. I'm yeah. Like, what do you want me to do? Okay, I'll do that. You know, and then what do you want me to do? I'll go to some twelve step meetings and and um. But then also, it's like, well, if I am screwed, and this is where the God piece will come in. If I'm screwed and my brain's broken, and if that's me, and if I think back to myself, it was, right? It was. I, I went back countless times with my lofty education and my cool career, whatever, and ruined it seemingly on purpose, right? So, like, <laughs> I qualify for that. <laughs> and if I accept that I'm screwed, like, like the evidence – of my life and like what the message that people that have gotten out are telling me the same thing. Well, then what, what chance do I have? Well, in, unless there's a God who can fix me, I might just stay screwed. But if there is a God that can fix me, that can remove, that, that can like really like fix the broken part of my brain, then maybe I have a chance. And then I have all these people telling me that ah, that's what happened to me. You know, that's what happened to me. And I already, I always believed in that, you know. But I, 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 the one thing that I was missing, I had believed in that second part, but I had never really fully grasped the first part. I had really never gotten to that point of like, okay, I'm, I'm fucked. I, there's nothing. I, you know, so being there, accepting the second part. Being, then I, being smart almost hurts you. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure, because the disease is in the brain. I mean, you, one thing that. You, th you, you know you're intelligent. You can figure this out. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and one thing that I think, I think people, you know, I think there's a lot about addiction that's counterintuitive or that's not what you might think. But I think one thing that people would eat more easily agree on is that the problem is in the brain. You know, it's not an elbow problem, right? <laughs> of why would someone continue to decide to go do this, this horrible thing? Um, so... Yeah, if you the smarter you are, it's it's you're going to be more inclined to use your brain to solve the problem and the problems, you know, a fault, you know, dysfunctional brain. <laughs> and you know, so once I experienced like the release or the like, I just you know, like like once I sort of got some momentum going of like, you know, I'm screwed, so whatever, you know. And then the desire, once I could kind of tell that the desire had been removed, that was a new experience for me. Even though I had been trying, I had been in like the rehab world and the 12-step the meeting world for many years and sort of intellectually talked about that place or listened about it or read about it. 
and when once it happened, it was I, I could tell that was a new experience. And so then I was like motivated to just continue to do all of those things that that people that are like me and that came out, just sort of following the lead of what they did once they were a month out, three months out, a year out, two years out, and so on. And there's people, and I, and another blessing of my life is I know people, lots of people in that, at all stages of it, you know, from, you know, brand new that I know guys with negative days of sobriety that need to get it, they need to go in all the way up to like 35 years. Um, and that's a, that's a cool sort of thing. And that's, that's a cool thing about like the recovery community or the people, which is a huge, there's thousands and thousands of people in LA that are sober, that were hardcore just like me and that are living life that way. And trying just to, uh, just do little things, you know, to, to maintain that, <clears throat> like a humility, you know, um, my attitude towards life today is far from like, I'm fucked. I don't care anymore. Like it's not nowhere near that. But I do little things, especially like in the mornings, to sort of remind myself or center on, um, like a like, hey, like I'm really lucky here, or like I'm blessed, or like this wasn't me. You know, like what I'm experiencing now, I did not create it. Like it came from whatever you want to say. I, I say God. And so let me stay humble to that, to that fact, you know, and then staying in touch. You know, I'm not really like when I came and talked to you last time, I was, you know, still single. I think I was still living on my own on the West side in like a little studio. I was still doing like uh, meetings constantly and very like five nights a week. Um, that's, that's reduced a little bit since I moved to Pasadena, but it's never gone to zero. Like I'm still on a weekly basis, a couple of times a week. And I have a couple, um, you know, responsibilities where I'm expected to be there and I'm still in touch with people and that. And um, every now and then I'll get a chance to talk to someone that is, just, is struggling or, you know, which, and it, that's always very rewarding, very rewarding. Hopefully right now I'm doing that <laughs> without them sitting there. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I'm sure I am, right? Like, yeah. like especially the people that no, watch the I think, I think people, talk. the people that watch the underbelly too. You know, so I, over here and there, there are people. I'll run into people. Let, it seems like less now than it was the first year. Yeah, um, we haven't seen you in a couple of years. Yeah. So hey, everybody, <laughs> good to see you. Um, but it seems like a certain type of person. No, no, I wouldn't want. I don't want to sh like shoehorn. And I'm sure like lots of people watch it, but in like the addiction and recovery community, like the percentage of people there that know about the underbelly and are, are watching the channel is a little bit higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. so. Yeah. But I think it's a wide range of, of people. But overall, it's definitely a wide range of people. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Well, I'm just, I'm just ecstatic that, that you yeah. came through. So am I, man. I just, I, so I, I. I always kind of, like I was, I was so frustrated we'd have those talks. I'm like, yeah. there's gotta be some, but I was trying to think it out. Yeah. Like you were at the time. Yeah. And it's really it, very, super, it's just super interesting to hear that yeah. It's almost like you have yeah. to stop doing that and just surrender. Yeah. Brutal honesty, you know, try that. I, was, I mean, I guess if we really want to say like the, the path to that point, could maybe it started the first time with you. Brutal honesty and now the whole world knows. And that took me to the East Coast where some, some really good things happened and some really bad things happened. But I never would have been there without doing this because it was a, a dear friend that was there, saw my interview, was worried that I was going to kill myself mm. because he was the same as me doing it. So seeing my interview, he he convinced me to go there. So I, that my journey went there. I, I still didn't stop, and on and on and on. And then so 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 it was like the honesty, and then like another year and a half or so of like a couple really super hardcore relapses where I was real honest <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> yes. Led me to the, led me to just like the end. Your videos I mean, are, I mean. Yeah, in, in a sick way, they were entertaining. I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. I never watched. You know, there a few different times over the last month, the past months and years, I've wanted to like watch more of your videos. You know, like and sometimes it's it's not, like, they're, not, they're not for everybody. I know, but I, 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 they are for me. You know, whenever I do it, but I'm my, I'm so like going from one thing to the other. Well, especially and, now, you're in a different. I never, yeah, I, I just never get the time or or, or make myself get in there but every time every now and then i'll watch and it's like man these are great i'm so. just proud of you well thank you man I'm incredibly thank proud you of thank you. you for helping me you know and this is great like like i'm very grateful um i think 
that is possible, you know, for anyone, if it's, if it's possible for me. Um, but I don't know that I can tell anyone how to do it, you know, other than keep trying. You, you yeah. were as lost as anybody yeah. that I've interviewed yeah. at, at, at a couple points there. Remember? You were just like, fuck. Yeah, it was awful. But there was still something in you that I saw that like, no, I- There was a part of me inside going like, what on, the, what on earth are you doing? What, what are you doing? I mean, you're, I mean, I just turned 46, which that's another crazy <laughs> idea. Yeah, you're what, what, 43 years old, 44 years old. What are you doing? How many years of, of debauchery was were there? Oh God, I first smoked crack when I was like 20. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. But so, but like over from like age 20 to let's say, I guess I must've been 44 when I got sober. So the 25 years. But it, was, it wasn't full blown. Never, no, it was, it was always like a, a, a real minority of the time. You know, mm-hmm. like I like there was it was at its it, it was at its except for the very beginning, the first five years or so, the last like six or seven years was when it was at its most frequent. But even then it was like two months out of the year, mm-hmm. you know, two, two and a half months out of the year. You were having fun for a couple of months. Though. Hard, though. You know, like I'd go six weeks. I'd sleep like five times in six weeks you know, for a couple of days and just going for it. But was it fun? There were fun parts of it in a sick way, you know, um, at the time, I, I guess I, I would think it was fun. Um, right now thinking back, it's like, I can remember feeling awesome, like right as I'm smoking crack or doing some sex thing. But that lasts for 30 seconds. Right? Yeah. I mean, it might last, I mean, like the, me feeling like this is great might last longer than 30 seconds, but never, <clears throat> never longer than like half an hour or an hour. And what you're going through now probably feels good consistently. It's not as extreme as intense, but it's like very peaceful, very, yeah. I mean, like, and I don't want to ever get like so accustomed to it that I stop being grateful. But just, I mean, there were so many times where just the idea that I could just like say, hey, Mark, I'll come on this day at five o'clock and then just drive over here, no problem. And be right on time. And freedom, right? I, I, I show up to work every day at the same time in the morning. You know, I, I sign up for these golf tournaments and stuff and go to them. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's the things that, it's, maybe it's a little bit sad, but the things that almost everybody just takes for granted, those of us that have this thing and then the, the poor people that are struggling with it right now, they don't, even get to even have an idea of what that's like, you know, they're stuck. I was stuck, you know, like w- walking from Highland Park to, to downtown LA at 4.30 in the morning, which is like a couple miles with $10 to my name to try to get a $10 rock, you know, because I didn't have a car anymore. And I was lucky that I even had a place to walk from to go down there. Like it's just, this is the little things it's little things. So we got to keep going. We got to help people when we, we have the, when we have the chance. I don't know. I, I thought I was going to be boring. Was I boring? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> I was going to tell you, ask me questions. Cause I don't feel like, no, I feel like now compared to back then. To, to me, this is the, the best talk we've done. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I thought maybe I wouldn't I mean, have people to... like the train wrecks, but, but yeah, right, right. but to well, me, this is, this is pretty fascinating. I talked about, you know, like, the, the, the first video of yours is a hell of a setup. You know, God works in mysterious ways, you know, like how did that happen? You know, how did I cross paths with you of all, of all things, but it, it did. And here we are. You know? Yeah. It's a beautiful story. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be inspired by it. I hope so. Patrick, I'm proud of you. Thanks, Mark. Hope you and Nancy have a long, happy life. I think we will. Thank you, man. All right.